Hey everyone, so this lesson is on hydradenitis superativa or HS. So we're going to talk about what this condition is in this lesson. We're also going to talk about some of the signs and symptoms, some of the triggers for this condition. We're also going to talk about how we can diagnose it and how we can treat it. So hydradenitis superativa is also known as acne inversus. It is a chronic inflammatory skin condition. It can often look like this. We're going to talk more about this later on in this lesson. Areas of the skin that are affected are often in areas where there are high concentrations of apocrine sweat glands. So apocrine sweat glands can be found in places like the armpits. The onset of this condition generally occurs during puberty. And the prevalence in general population is about 4%. So there are specific risks and associated factors with regards to hydradenitis superativa. One of them is family history. So it seems that there are genetic components to this condition. There seems to be an autosomal dominant trait. So if one of your parents has it, you have a higher likelihood of having it as well. Being overweight or obese or having metabolic syndrome increases your risk for having this condition as well. Smoking. Smoking can actually increase your risk for getting this condition or increase the triggering of getting these skin lesions and being of the female gender as well. And what we do find is that symptoms of hydradenitis superativa, so these skin lesions, seem to fluctuate with the menstrual cycle. So there's some hormonal component with regards to this condition. What is the pathophysiology of hydradenitis superativa? So it all starts with a defective hair follicle. So we talked about it's in areas with high concentrations of apocrine sweat glands. And this defective hair follicle becomes blocked. So you see here the hair follicle becomes blocked. Many different epithelial cells and even bacteria get in here and start to cause inflammation. And what happens is the follicle can rupture and can lead to surrounding inflammation. You can have recruitment of immune cells. So white blood cells can come into the area. And then these cells can be released as well. And you can have the bacteria being released and you can have drainage from the follicle. So this is really a simplified look at the pathophysiology. It all starts with a defective hair follicle that becomes blocked and eventually ruptures. So what are some of the clinical findings in this condition? Intertriginous areas are the most commonly affected. What are intertriginous areas? Intertriginous areas are where skin meets skin. So again, the axilla or armpits are one location. The groin could be another location, the perineal or perianal areas, and inframammary or underneath the breasts. There are specific triggers of these skin lesions. We talked about a couple of these. Menstruation seems to be one of them. Again, the symptoms fluctuate with the menstrual cycle. Stress is also another trigger. So having increased stress in one's life can increase the development of these skin lesions. Excessive sweating is another one. So again, it occurs a lot of times in the armpits. So excessive sweating in those areas can actually increase the blocking of hair follicles and lead to more skin lesions. Weight gain is also another one. This could be related to both hormonal, but also having that increased surface area of more skin on skin contact. Now there are specific prodromal symptoms in affected areas that occur before the eruption of skin lesions. So an individual who doesn't have the skin lesions in their armpits or in another part of their body yet can start to have issues with pain in those areas. They can also have some burning, itching as well, and can have hyperhidrosis or excessive sweating. So the excessive sweating could be a trigger, but could also be a prodromal symptom, a symptom that occurs before the individual has the development of the skin lesion. And what we do find is that these symptoms, the pain, the burning, the itching, and the hyperhidrosis or the excessive sweating occur 12 to 48 hours prior to onset of the skin lesion. So what are these skin lesions like? Well, they are actually recurrent inflammatory skin lesions. So they're recurrent in the sense that they can 
develop and then they can go away, they can come back again with those triggers we talked about before. They're inflammatory because of the pathophysiology we talked about before. The defective hair follicle becomes blocked and can rupture and cause local inflammation. And the skin lesions themselves can be anything from nodules, abscesses that are filled with pus, draining tracts, so it's essentially where the pus and the fluid from the lesion has led to the skin and can allow that fluid to drain. And there can also be scarring from this as well. So all of these can be findings we see with this condition. So you can see things like this. So you can see both of these are in the axilla. So you can see here, here are some abscesses and possibly some sites of drainage. You can see here around the gluteal area, some spots where there may be some draining tracks as well. And then here is another spot where it is very eroded and there's again more draining tracks that look like they have essentially ruptured so again there's skin lesions that are painful and have purulent drainage or drain pus and when you have these lesions when they occur they can last for days to months so they can last for a long time how do we make the diagnosis of this condition though how do we actually say this is hydradenitis suppurativa. So the diagnosis involves looking at a few different things. We look at the skin lesions themselves. Are they nodules? Are they abscesses? And do they have draining tracts? And not just that, but the location of those lesions. So we see that there are nodules, abscesses, or draining tracts, and then we see them in intertriginous areas. So that is basically making us very suspicious that this is hydradenitis suppurativa. And then when we look at the symptoms over time, do these skin lesions relapse and are they chronic? So are they recurrent? Do they develop in the armpits of an individual and then go away, but then come back again with possibly one of those triggers we talked about before? So looking at these three categories, skin lesions, the type of skin lesions, the location of those lesions, and then the symptoms over time, if we have those three, that very much helps us make the diagnosis of this condition. When we've made the diagnosis, how do we treat it? So one of the first things that I always talk about with regards to treatment is lifestyle modification. That's the first thing I always want you to think about if we can actually do that. So what can we do with regards to lifestyle modification in hydradenitis suppurativa? So one of the things we can do is weight loss. So we talked about this before, weight gain seems to be a trigger for the skin lesions in this condition. And we also talked about being overweight, obese, and having metabolic syndrome is an associated risk for having hydradenitis suppurativa. So perhaps losing weight will reduce your risk of having recurrent skin lesions from this condition. So weight loss and smoking cessation are already great things. So these can also possibly help you reduce your risk for getting these recurrent skin lesions in hydradenitis suppurativa. Some of the other treatments include topical antibiotics. We often use clindamycin. If they don't work, we can move on to systemic antibiotics like tetracyclines. And because there appears to be a hormonal interaction with hydradenitis suppurativa, as we see it fluctuates with the menstrual cycle, hormone therapy may be used as well. So when I say hormone therapy here, I mean OCPs or oral contraceptive pills. Sometimes you may see anti-androgens being used as well. But what I really want you to focus on is some of these lifestyle modification, weight loss, smoking cessation, and then we can move down the line if those don't work. Topical antibiotics, systemic antibiotics, and can move on to hormonal therapies like OCPs or oral contraceptive pills. So I hope you found this lesson helpful and informative. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel. And as always, I hope to see you next time, and thank you so much for watching.